This week on Spoke TV, we're taking a look at events happening in the region. Iron Chef brought more than just food. We're all in this business to enjoy ourselves and make some good food. And one drama teacher puts her heart in her job. But is it too much? And by 2012, we had figured out that it was called cardiac sarcoidosis. Plus, the Canada Games could be coming to Waterloo. This is a battle between four competing cities, and each of the cities has um, their own advantages. Find out more on this week's episode. Hello, I'm Cassandra McNeil. And I'm Christina Bruce. We've got a great show for you today, but first up, Canada's 2021 Games are just four years away, but the decision on where it will be held needs to be chosen soon. Spoke TV's Justin Emanuel looks at Canada's own little Summer Olympics. The Canada Games will be making another round in summer of 2021, and this time they may be coming close to home. The hashtag WeRally2021, according to Teddy Katz, the spokesperson for the region's big committee, is a call to bring the community together early. This is a battle between four competing cities and each of the cities has um, their own advantages and their own benefits that the Canada Games might look at as the reason to go uh, to Niagara, to Sudbury, to Ottawa, or in our case, to the Waterloo region. Carla Nering, a local triathlete and runner, says there's still a long way to go, but the Games could still be more of a boost than an obstacle. I think there's a lot of things that are developing or still in the background. Uh, the Games, will help us focus more on what is needed to make this a top-notch um, athletic community. Should we win the bid for the 2021 Canada Games, many of the region's facilities will come together to host the event, including here at Rim Park in the city of Waterloo. Katz believes that a hard-fought bid could be an ideal chance to put their region to the test. This is uh, a perfect blend of um, some might say small town feel, a very, very friendly community, but also a very large community, a fast growing community with close to a, um, a half a million people living within this region. So we feel that we're bringing together the best of, of those two worlds. The final decision will be announced on February 28th. For Spoke TV, I'm Justin Emanuel. Thanks Justin. The Cambridge strike has marched its way across headlines. A resolution has been reached. Here's Tyler LaCourse with a look at what the issues were and if the Cambridge outside workers and the city are both happy with the results. This past week, the City of Cambridge and the Canadian Union of Public Employees reached a deal to end a six-day strike. The strike, which was the first of its kind in the City of Cambridge since 1978, brought closures to many of the public-run facilities in the area. Local president of the CUPE Union, Raymond Burigana, explains his side of the strike. Well, I mean, it was all about fairness. It was about being able to, um, you know, t t tell the... the, the city council and everything like that that were underpaid. According to Bergana, outdoor workers were underpaid between 8 and 12 percent to their provincial comparisons. Cambridge Mayor Doug Craig also radiates the message of fairness being involved in the process of striking. But it wasn't the only reason why the city felt the need to get the deal done. done. It's, uh, it's about uh, being fair. First of all, to the taxpayers, could we afford uh, the, the demands of the union, which we could. And secondly, uh, because of the uh, fact that when, when people go on strike on the outside, they shut down all our arenas and pools. It's important to get things back to normal. So the new contract will see the city workers get a $1.25 initial starting raise, plus a 2% increase for every year in the duration of the contract, which expires in the year 2020. Well, I mean, I'd just like to say again, honestly, thank you for the public support. The support was overwhelming. Uh, and thanks for the city for, for listening to us. I mean, yeah, it was a bit of a struggle, but uh, we're all grateful that, that they listened, and honestly, we got a good deal, and we're all really happy. For Spoke TV, I'm Tyler LaCour. Perfect. Thanks, Tyler. In other news, those who love to drink beer will love that Ontario is looking to have 80 more grocery retailers sell beer across the province. Ontario has decided to expand beer and cider sales to 80 more grocery stores. Right now, there are 130 grocery retailers across the province that are authorized to sell beer and cider. Currently, the real Canadian superstore on Highland, Sobeys Northfield in Paris, and Zares Cambridge are able to sell beer in the region. 
the government wants to create more jobs and help grow the economy through the expansion. Authorized grocery store locations will be announced in May, with sales expected to start this summer. Coming up after the break, find out, find out what's happening in the fentanyl overdose crisis, what you should look for at home, and the teacher who puts her heart in her job. The increasing use of fentanyl, an issue that has been ongoing across the country, has affected many people due to overdoses. Spoke TV's Justine Frazier finds out the effects the drug has on people and how local clinics are aiming to help. With the recent increase in fentanyl overdoses, Ontario may see a rise in fatalities. The deadly opioid has become more widely available. One in eight deaths among 18 to 34 year olds in Ontario is now the result of opioids. Sanguine Health Center provides safety and support for drug users, including those using prescription opioids. When it's mixed, you can't guarantee that the same amount is in the same size. So if I have two um, points of fentanyl, one point can have a certain amount of fentanyl in it and the other point will not be the same amount. So if somebody uses a certain amount one time and then they think they're okay that time and they think they can use the same amount next time, it might be way more than what they were expecting. They provide opioid users with naloxone kits that will help them if they are overdosing. Greg Schantz has been using prescription opioids since he was 21. Now 27, he has experienced several overdoses, which taught him that fentanyl is hidden in many other drugs. You can press it into any pill or you can cut it into any other drug, like cocaine or heroin, that's why it's, and it's so cheap, like that's why it's becoming such a problem because it's like 800 times cheaper than heroin and it's, uh, 300 times po more powerful. For Spoke TV, I'm Justine Fraser. Thanks, Justine. Carbon monoxide is very dangerous and detecting it is extremely important. Spoke TV's Brittany Borlon finds out how a local man has helped spread awareness about the potentially deadly gas. Waterloo Fire Rescue reminds us that winter weather can increase the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning. John Percy from Waterloo Fire Rescue says carbon monoxide, otherwise known as the silent killer, is more dangerous than smoke from a fire. When there is a fire in the home, you can see it, you can taste it, your local smoke alarm will go off. But with carbon monoxide poisoning in the home, it's totally invisible. In 2015, after six years of hard work and determination, John Janak, founder of the Hawkins Janak Foundation, had a law passed enforcing CO alarms in every home across the province. Janak was personally affected by carbon monoxide in 2008 when his niece Lori, her husband Richard, and their two children, Cassandra and Jordan, passed away in their Woodstock home due to carbon monoxide. Eight years ago, it was not very well known by anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's why I thought, this is a scary thing. If it could kill people that easily, somebody needs to get out there and start warning people about the dangers. So that's why I, I, I decided to get out there. The foundation has two primary purposes, to educate people on the dangers of carbon monoxide gas and to raise funds to purchase carbon monoxide alarms. More information on the Hawkins Janak Foundation and carbon monoxide awareness can be found on the Foundation's website and thesilence.ca. For Spoke TV, I'm Brittany Bordelon. Thanks, Brittany. And some great ways to keep your home safe from carbon monoxide are to have your appliances serviced annually and never run any gasoline-powered engines in an enclosed area. Being a teacher and being involved in theatre can be very hard for some people, but it can be especially hard for someone who is dealing with a heart condition that limits their ability. Spoke TV's Stefan Singh has more. She is pretty well 100% committed to everything that needs to happen and seeing it through. She put everything into it, like everything she had was put into those shows. I just don't like making commitments that I can't keep, and if I can't keep them, I get very upset with myself. Yeah. Yupi Gokhale is a teacher and a program coordinator of the Stage and Screen Arts Specialist High Skills major program at Brantford Collegiate Institute. She is also the president of Theatre Ancaster. Gokhale works hard and puts everything she has into the work she does, and the people she works with and teaches recognize that. Cooper Bilton is a grade 12 student at BCI and has been able to work with Gokhale over his four years at the school. She definitely knows what she wants, and it's great, and that's what you need in a director. Um, never hard, like never mean about it, but she has very, very strong visions. 
Sam Frisk is the acting director of youth programming at Theatre Ancaster, and he has worked with Gokhale for eight years, which means he knows the way she likes to attack different projects. She is an extreme planner. Like, she is a person, she thinks very far ahead, and she has everything mapped out and planned out way, way in advance. Balancing being a teacher, a president of a theatre company, and a mom can make life really tough. And in 2011, Nupi's life would be changed forever. In 2000 and. 11, I got really sick, and by 2012, they had figured out that it was called cardiac sarcoidosis. This heart condition is a rare disease which clusters of white blood cells form in the tissues of the heart. According to the Heart Institute at the University of Ottawa, the cause of this rare disease is still not known. Newby has had to make some adjustments to her life, so she's able to continue directing and going through her day-to-day -day life. So I had all of August, and they told me basically they didn't know how I'd feel. They didn't know if I'd be able to return to work or not. They said, just see how you feel over the month. They gave me very little information. I just had to go on how I felt, so I immediately dropped down to one class. Throughout this process, Gokhale and Frisk were working together and both had to learn from each other. Um, but anyway, I like to think there's been a fair amount of like give and take with us. You know, she's taught me a couple of things about how she works, so I'm able to work with her. I've been able to talk to her about, you know, this works really well for me, so that, you know, she and I have been able to work pretty well together in that way. While directing Joseph in the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat in 2014 at BCI, Newby had to rent something to help her direct. As far as actually directing, uh, she was in a hospital bed for most of Joseph. Uh, that was a first. I had rented a hospital bed because I literally was totally awake and alert, but I knew that I had to like lie down. And so I thought, well, I could be at rehearsal if I had a bed. Despite having this rare heart condition, which should have limited her abilities to do a lot, Newby never gave up on her commitments. I would push myself to be here probably sometimes when I definitely shouldn't have been. When she does push herself to be there for her students, her honesty is appreciated. Once in a while she'll get tired, but um, usually when that happens she's pretty honest about it and she'll tell the class that uh, today she's feeling dizzy or something and she needs to stay seated or something. Nupi has been a teacher in the Grand Erie District School Board for over 20 years and she has made a decision that is better for her and her health. So I am retiring from education. I'm not retiring from working with youth. I'm not trying to get out of working with teens. I, that's that's going to be the hardest part for me. Yeah. It's going to be very difficult. And for yeah, Spoke TV, I'm Stefan Singh. Coming up, everyone loves a good cooking battle. We take you to a local Iron Chef competition. <laughs> Conestoga College recently hosted an Iron Chef competition at Binghamins. The event aims to bring attention to the culinary skills of Conestoga students as they teamed up with the region's top chefs. Spoke TV's Maddie DeMart was there. On February 9th, about 400 guests filled Marshall Hall at Binghamins for the Iron Chef Waterloo Region competition. Ten chefs from local restaurants were teamed up with future top chefs from Conestoga's culinary arts program. They competed to receive the prestigious title of Iron Chef Waterloo Region. In learning how they are prepared a meal, everyone has their unique style, and also every kitchen has their own uh, way of preparing the meal. Not only were the teams challenged to create a unique dish with pork shoulder, their creation had to incorporate a Canadian theme. The chefs were also challenged not to make pulled pork, which is the go-to for pork shoulder. The VIP judges included Anne Yaromovic, culinary judge for Chopped Canada, and Jason Bangerter, executive chef at Langdon Hall Country House Hotel and Spa. The Iron Chef event is a great way for local chefs to showcase their culinary skills, but how does it benefit the students? It's just a great opportunity to collaborate and get them out and experience and for us to get out and have some fun. Uh, have fun. That's it. This is what it's all about is have fun, right? We're all in this business to enjoy ourselves and make some good food. Lancaster Smokehouse won the title for their three unique sausages with sauerkraut and mustards, followed by Borealis Grill and Bar, taking second place for their tender spiced pork chunk served with a sweet potato puree and a kale chip. The event raised $16,000 in support of Conestoga's culinary arts program, which will go towards scholarships for students. For Spoke TV, I'm Maddie DeMart. Thanks, Maddie. Eight years after an incident at Cineplex Cinemas, one family is suing the theater. A Kitchener family is taking Cineplex to court after their son went into cardiac arrest at the theater in 2009. Chad Vinoff and his parents are seeking intensive rehab to improve his walking and money to ensure he is financially secure when they are no longer around. 
The Wienhoff family say that after their son choked on popcorn and became unresponsive, Cineplex did nothing to help him. Cineplex and Wienhoff have stated that he was on illegal substances at the time of the incident. No allegations have been proven, and a civil trial is set for March 20th. In sports, a hockey coach in Kitchener is helping kids break the ice on Canada's favorite sport. Now to Adam Reinhardt on how free hockey for children was achieved. On a chilly November night at Kitchener's Sports World Arena, something truly heartwarming is happening on the ice. The Pioneer Park Panthers, a free-to-play, volunteer-led hockey club and learn-to-skate program for kids from lower-income families, is having practice. Founder and coach Steve Sanderson is proud of the program's growth. Oh, it's been grown immensely. We've uh, started off with about 15 kids um, 15 years ago, and we're up to 145 kids. We outfit all their equipment from head to toe, all the ice time, everything that they need is provided for free. Sanderson's passion is not only an inspiration to the kids he coaches, but to the volunteers he works with as well. He's really good with the kids, and with us, he's really uh, understanding of our schedules and stuff, so he's just overall a really great coach. Since its founding in 2002, the Pioneer Park Panthers hockey program has received numerous national awards, been featured on CBC's Hockey Day in Canada, and in 2009, founder Steve Sanderson had his name added to a permanent display in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Given the financial toll that hockey can have on any family, it's no wonder Sanderson's program is so popular. In my opinion, you shouldn't have to pay to play hockey, and it's free and it's lots of fun and it helps you with skill development. For Sanderson himself, however, the reward is as simple as it is moving. Uh, just seeing the kids every day smiling, yeah, we saw them on the ice, I just love being out there, there's no pressure. For Spoke TV, I'm Adam Reinhardt. We'll be back with a look at a local organization helping teens cope with bullying. WAVE is an organization helping youth to speak out on important issues like violence and bullying. Spoke TV's Christina Bruce finds out how WAVE has helped one high school student. Like the summer of before grade 7, um, I was friends with this girl. She was on um, my sports team. We spent every single day together. We lived really close to each other. Our parents were friends. Um, and I would do anything for her. She was my best friend. I loved her so much. Hayden Cowie, a student at Cameron Heights, was friends with a girl since grade seven until she realized she was in a toxic relationship. It would be the little things like we would be hanging out and she would say, oh my God, you're, the, you're so stupid. You're just the worst. Like, and she would call me ugly and just say things that I think she might have thought were okay or we're just in good nature, but we're really, really unacceptable and really rude. But then she realized something needed to change. And it got to kind of a tipping point where I just kind of decided that enough was enough. And it was actually after the WAVE presentation that I received where I realized that her behavior wasn't okay and the way she was treating me wasn't okay. So I stood up for myself and I said, you can't treat me like this anymore. Um, if you don't treat me better, I can't be around you anymore. And our friendship kind of just ended and I was so much happier. I created better friendships and I'm in a much better place now because of it. WAVE, which has been around since 2001, stands for Wellness Acceptance Youth Voices Empowerment. It is a program meant to help young people who are dealing with violence, mental health, or bullying. It is a support system run by Jennifer Durst and Rebecca Pister, who are both youth engagement facilitators of WAVE. Pister says that the most prevalent form of bullying happening now is cyberbullying. It's happening behind that screen. Um, you see it on Facebook and on Snapchat and on Instagram. It's just kind of everywhere and it makes it so that the young people don't really have any release or any way to kind of move away from it. So not only is it the most prevalent, but it's kind of almost happening consistently. Durst says that the WAVE program is a place where young people can really make a difference and it provides an escape from these issues. And knowing that if you're really passionate about something that um, you have the power to make a change in your community um, and WAVE really provides that for youth. Cowie says that WAVE's message is meant to impact those who are going through tough times. The most impactful message of our presentation is just kind of saying that like you're not alone 
it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to um, admit that you might be struggling because that was something that I never really did. So just telling people that it's okay. Just because you're struggling, it's okay. Things will be okay. Kister says that those who have come and gone through the program have seen the difference WAVE makes. I was cleaning out one of my rooms and I came across a letter that was written to me um, by one of our old youth as she was leaving the program and it was a thank you letter, um, very heartfelt, just expressing how much the program had meant to her, but not just the program, but myself and, and Jen as well. Um, so I think the relationships that we develop here are really strong and they're very special and they're very unique. For Spoke TV, I'm Christina Bruce. And now we go to Cassandra McNeil and Alan Broadhagen for what they thought about two movies that are fighting for Best Picture at the Oscars. Thanks, Christina. With six Oscar nominations, including Best Supporting Actor and Actress, Lion is a movie di directed by Garth Davis. You were lucky enough to see it. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, it's based on a true story about a five-year-old boy named Saru who gets in the, on the wrong train and takes, uh, gets taken 1,000 miles away from his family and home. Eventually, after going through a bunch of things, uh, no one let no one, let alone a child, should go through. Uh, he's adopted by an Australian couple, 25 years later, with only a few memories uh, and a new technology uh, called Google Earth. Uh, Saru goes on a journey to find his old home and let his family know that he's okay. So what do you think about it? I loved it. Uh, Dev Patel was fantastic as uh, adult Saru. And Nicole Kidman is absolutely deserving of her nomination of Best Supporting Actress uh, for her portrayal of Sue, Saru's adoptive mother. Uh, I think if you like a movie that's based off of a true story, uh, Lion is that kind of movie for you. Um, another Oscar nominated movie that is actually breaking records with 14 nominations is La La Land, and you saw that. What's that movie about? Uh, it's a modern musical about Mia, an inspiring actress, and Sebastian is a jazz musician that wants to open up his own jazz bar. And it tells a story about how their lives come together and how they kind of help each other through the trials of reaching their dreams. Um, what did you think about that movie? I loved it. I saw it three times so far and each time I leave the f theater feeling different and I thought that it brings new life into the genre and uh, remains nostalgic without seeming tired and uh, the music has been stuck in my head ever since I saw it. Uh, you could really tell that it was Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone's third movie together because their chemistry was on point. That's awesome. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see which one wins uh, Best Picture at the Oscars. It sure will. Back to you, Christina. Thanks, Cass and Allen. Taking a look at movies, IMDb has a list of 38 films coming up for 2017. The list includes anticipated movies like The Power Rangers, Justice League, Wonder Woman, and Beauty and the Beast. A new Pirates of the Caribbean, Thor, and Avengers movies are also on the way. If you're looking for some live local entertainment, Center in the Square is hosting two concerts by the Youth Orchestra and Bailman Place Sibelius on February 17th and 18th, Blue Rodeo on February 28th, and Alan Doyle on March 29th. You can get tickets for many artists coming to the Toronto area in the upcoming months. Coldplay is playing at the Rogers Centre on August 21st, and Justin Bieber will also be at the Rogers Centre on September 5th and 6th. And that's a quick look at your entertainment. I'm so excited about all the great stuff they have coming. Yeah, we have so many great movies and concerts to look forward to. Do you think you're going to go to any of them? I'll definitely look forward to it. I know I'm excited to see the new Pirates movie. Oh, I'm so excited for the new Wonder Woman. Well, that's all we have for today. Be sure to check us out online at SpokeTV.ca, YouTube, and Twitter. For Spoke TV, I'm Christina Bruce. And I'm Cassandra McNeil.